Welcome back to Cardinal Science. This is part two of the video on percentage yield and empirical formulae. Please see part one before moving on. In part one of this video, we looked at points 1.30 and 1.31. We're going to continue with 1.31 today, looking at water and salts containing water of crystallization. Then moving on to 1.32, know what is meant by the terms empirical formula and molecular formula, and 1.33, calculating empirical and molecular formulae from experimental data. Okay, so we have to be able to do a similar thing now, but for water or hydrated salts. So we'll start with trying to explain what a hydrated salt is. Okay, so a hydrated salt is an ionic compound, so for example, magnesium oxide, that is associated to a number of water molecules. And what we're trying to do is really is figure out how many water molecules there are associated with it. So for example, You've got hydrated copper sulfate. Now, copper sulfate on its own, right, anhydrous without water, is CuSO4. But when five water molecules associate themselves with it, you get hydrated copper sulfate, like this. Now, this means you've got copper sulfate and then X, right, that just means with five H2O molecules. Okay? Now, we're going to look at a certain method to figure out how we knew that it was five, because it's not five for everything it's five for copper sulfate. Now this method is similar to the other one, but not quite the same. We don't use a crucible, instead we use an evaporating dish. So evaporating dish, and then we would put our hydrated salts in here, okay, and we're gonna heat them up and something's gonna happen. I'll explain what happens later. Okay, so similarly to the other one, we're gonna measure the mass of the evaporating dish first, okay? Then we're going to add a known mass of hydrated salt. So we're going to measure the mass on a, on a balance and put that into our evaporating dish and we'll have already measured the mass of the dish. Now in this case, we're going to do this with hydrated copper sulfate. So copper sulfate, when it's hydrated, is actually blue. But copper sulfate, when it is anhydrous, is white. So what you do in this case is you heat the blue copper sulfate until it turns completely white, i.e. all the water has left. We record the mass of the evaporating dish. It should be less now, okay, because we've lost some water. Now the mass of the anhydrous salt, so that's the white salt that you've just made by heating up the hydrated copper sulfate, is calculated by subtracting the mass of the evaporating dish at the end from the evaporating dish at the beginning, because of course at the end it contains the white salt also. And then we figure out the mass of the water that's been lost by subtracting the mass of the white salt from the mass of the hydrous salt, right? So the hydrous salt mass is what we've already measured in the beginning. I'll show you an example in a moment. Okay, so let's imagine we have our evaporating dish and we've measured its mass and it's 50 grams. We then add 10 grams of hydrated copper sulfate or any hydrous salt, but in this case we'll do copper sulfate, 10 grams of that. Now, after we've heated it up, we measure the mass and the mass is now 56.4. So we've now got rid of the water in our salt and we've lost some mass, haven't we? Because of course it should really be 60 grams at this point. So the mass of the anhydrous salt is 50 grams, which is the evaporating dish, take away, or rather removed from the evaporating dish and the hydrous salt that we just calculated, so 6.4 grams. The mass of the water is the difference between the anhydrous salt and the hydrous salt. So we put 10 grams of hydrous salt in the beginning and we have only 6.4 grams of anhydrous at the end. The difference is of course 3.6 grams, so that's 3.6 grams of water. All right, so like before, we now need to calculate the moles of the salt, All right, the salt in this case is copper sulfate, and of the water, and we're gonna compare them and then figure out the ratio between them and that will tell us how many water molecules there were around each copper sulfate molecule. So the moles of copper sulfate is going to be the mass of the anhydrous salt, in this case copper sulfate, divided by its MR. And the MR of copper sulfate is 159.5, which gives us 0 0.04 moles. And of the water, we've got 3.6 grams and the MR is 18, which gives us 0 0.2 moles. Now what you do in this case is you divide each of these by whichever one is smallest. So we divide them both by 0 0.04. 
Now 0 0.04 divided by 0 0.04 is going to be 1. 0 0.2 divided by 0 0.04 is 5, which means the ratio between copper sulfate and water is 1 to 5, which means, of course, that we have COSO4 X and then 5 H2O. If it was 1 to 7, then that would be 7 H2O. If it was 1 to 9, it would be 9 H2O, etc. OK, so here's another example. Uh, give this one a go on your own and we'll go through it. So what we're looking for is the N here. So we want to know the number of water molecules that would be bonded to aluminium nitrate. OK, so our evaporating dish has a mass of 50. The mass of hydrous salt that we're adding is 20 grams. Then after the heating, the mass of the evaporating dish and the anhydrous salt is 61.36 grams. So the mass of the anhydrous salt is therefore 61.36 take away 50, which is 11.36 grams. So that's the mass of aluminium nitrate, anhydrous. And the mass of water is 20 grams, the mass of the hydrous salt, take away the mass of the anhydrous salt, which gives us 8.64. So again, we've got our salt and we've got water. Okay, and we'll figure out the moles of each one. So the salt we have 11.36 grams of, and the MR of aluminium nitrate I've put over here, which is 213, which gives us 0.053 moles. Now for water, we've got 8.64 grams, and we're going to divide that by 18, which gives us 0.48 moles. Now again, what we do is we divide by the smallest one. So we divide each of them by 0 0.053. This gives us one to nine. Therefore, the ratio between aluminum nitrate and water is one to nine. And our equation is AlNO3, 3x, 9H2O. Okay. Now moving on to 1.32, empirical and molecular formulae. Well, firstly, what are they? So an empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratio of atoms of each element in a compound. Don't worry if it doesn't make sense yet, it will as we move on. A molecular formula is the actual number of atoms of each element present in a compound. Okay, so for example, propene okay, is composed of hydrogen and carbon. Its molecular formula is C3H6. So if you had some propene, what you've got is a bunch of C3H6 molecules all bumbling around together. However, the ratio between the carbon and the hydrogen, three to six, that is not the simplest whole number ratio, is it? Three to six can be simplified down to one to two. So the empirical formula of propene is CH2, whereas the molecular formula is C3H6. Okay, so let's do an example. So what's the empirical formula for a compound that is composed of 20 grams of hydrogen and 160 grams of oxygen? Okay, so we'll start off by calculating the number of moles, and then we'll simplify the ratio as far as we can get. So hydrogen, oxygen, moles for hydrogen is going to be 20 grams divided by the AR, which is 1, which is, of course, 20. And for oxygen, it's going to be 160 divided by 16, which is, of course, 10. Now, we've therefore got a mole ratio of 20 to 10, which is the same as, as simple as we can make it, 2 to 1. Therefore, our um, um, empirical formula is going to be H2O. Two hydrogens for one oxygen. OK, another common way to ask this question is instead of giving masses, actually giving percentages. So there's a pre-step here. Whenever you get given a question like this with percentages in, you just have to assume that you've got 100 grams of compound. So in your answer, the first thing you want to write down is assume 100 grams of compound. Then we do the same thing. So we've got magnesium, sulfur and oxygen. And we obviously now, since we've assumed 100 grams, have 24 grams of magnesium divided by the AR, which is 24, which is one. We have 30 grams of sulfur and the AR is 32. And of course, we then have 46 grams of oxygen and the AR is 16. Now, the moles of each of those are 0 0.9375 and 2.875 respectively. So 
just like before, we divide by the smallest one. Okay, so what we're going to get therefore is 1 divided by 0 0.9375, 0 0.9375 divided by 9375, and 2.875 divided by 0 0.9375. Okay, and what we get there is 1.067 to 1 to 3.067. Now what we can do at this stage is round. So essentially this brings us out to 1 to 1 to 3, which of course gives us an empirical formula of MgSO3. Okay, so the other way that we can ask questions about this is kind of the other way around. We now need to calculate the molecular formulae from the empirical formula. So the question might go like this. The empirical formula of X, some compound, is CH2. So we know there are twice as many hydrogens as there are carbons in this molecule. And the relative formula mass of that molecule is 56. So how do you figure out the molecular formula? Right. First step is to calculate the relative molecular mass of the empirical formula. So the empirical formula has a relative molecular mass of C, which is 12, plus 2 H's, which is 14. So we've got 14. We divide the MR of X, okay, we don't know where X is, by the MR of the empirical formula. So we do 56 divided by 14, which equals 4. Then we multiply each element in our compound, right, our carbon and our hydrogen, by the answer to step 2, by 4. So we started off with CH2, and now we're going to end up with C4H8. That is our molecular formula. Because, of course, C4H8, if you were to check now, adds up to 56, doesn't it? So C4, C times 4, H times 8. Well, that's going to be 4 times 12 and 1 times 8, which, of course, is 48 plus 8, which is 56. So it matches up. So we figured out the molecular formula, having been given the empirical formula and the relative formula mass of the molecule. OK, so maybe pause the video and have a try at this one and then see if your answer mat matches what we do. So the empirical formula is CH2 again, but we don't know what X is. We know its relative formula mass is 140. So the MR of the empirical formula is, of course, 14. We divide 140 by 14, which gives us 10. And then we're going to multiply each of our elements by 10. So it becomes C10H20. And we could check that, if you like, to see if it matches. So C10 is, of course, going to be 10 times 12, which is 120. And H20 is going to be 20 multiplied by 1, which is, of course, 20. And they add up together to make 140. So it all works. Thank you for watching Cardinal Science. I hope this has been helpful for you. If you need any clarification or help on the topics, please leave a comment below. And if you enjoyed the content, please like and subscribe. Take care.